Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to give my greetings, first of all, to the President of the Basque Government, to the Minister of Education of the Basque Government, to Madame Minister of Education, Vocational Education and Training of the Spanish Government, the Commissioner of the European Commission, who was uh, who communicated with us via his uh, video, and his senior expert today, Jean Santos, and other authorities of the Basque Government and Spanish Government, directors and staff of the hundreds of Tibet institutions that are present today at this exciting event. I'd like to give my sincere thanks uh, for the invitation to be present at this World Congress uh, to Jorge Arevalo, the Vice Minister of Vocational Education and Training in the Basque Government, uh, John Agustin and the team at Technica. We'll be seeing you all a little bit later because we will be signing an MOU of, of collaboration with Technica and my institution. And also to Don Ward, it's a delight uh, to meet you as well, the President of the World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. I will, um, let me give you all just a, first a bit of a view of, I'm the director of ILO Sintafor, the International Labor Organization's uh, Center for Knowledge in Vocational Education and Training. We're located in Montevideo, Uruguay, but we're a regional office. In fact, we're actually a, um, an Ibero-American office because in addition to Latin America and the Caribbean, we also have membership uh, affiliation with Spain, Portugal, and also Cabo Verde. Um, just a few words, because I think uh, for you to know us at ILO Center 4, but also it's very much related to the discussion and the reason why we're all here for these next two days. Center 4 was created in 1963 in response to the requests of countries, the ministries of labor and education and TVED institutions in Latin America. As I said, we've grown and expanded over these last decades. But what's very interesting is that it's Center 4 plays a role of coordination between these Tibet institutions. If we look at the impact of our member institutions and their leverage capacity in the region, they actually reach out to millions and millions of training participations per year. So the impact that we have is actually through our affiliate organizations, which are now over 60 in the region. In that regard, I'd like to take a moment to actually send a special greeting to the directors of TVET institutions and their staff who are here present. They've traveled from different parts of Latin America, from our region, uh, to be here in person, to share and interact with you, and they actually represent our delegation from ILO Center 4 at this event. So I'm very pleased that they're all here too as well. These cordiales saludos a todos nuestros miembros. Uh, the point about telling you a bit about our story is that the request to create ILO Center 4, which would be this organization for the coordination between different Tibet institutions in our region, was that six decades ago, Latin American countries and their ministries of labor and the Tibet institutions realized that they needed to train. They needed, in order to harness the potential of the industrialization process in the mid-1900s was that they needed skilled people to be able to work in the factories in all the industri industries that they, were trying, that they were investing in and they were trying to move forward. So that endogenization process of industrial development was founded upon the needs for institutions that were solid and strong and capable to build the skills that were necessary amongst their own population to be able to work in these industries. So it's quite clear of everything we're talking about today because this conviction remains relevant to this very day and in the context of the current technological transformation that we're living. So that's the purpose and thank you for knowing a little bit about us and how we work. Taking a little bit, and I think a lot of what I'm saying, I have the pleasure of actually just reinforcing a lot of what has already been said, which I think is a very good point that we're all sort of aligning ourselves in these early discussions. First of all, the big question is how to harness all the potential of this technological transformation that people have been talking about and that have been the opening statements in this conference. Um, while we do know that there's a great deal of potential, there is concern. There's a great deal of concern about technological change these transformations and that they make the impacts they may have on the world of work the technological unemployment possibilities for ops, uh, occupational obsolescence and these issues are real 
because for the first time, technology now starts to uh, be, offer the potential to conduct tasks that maybe replicate some of the cognitive functions that we've always considered to be exclusively human. So I'd like to take Jorge Arevalo's uh, challenge to be able to overcome fear and to look instead about ways that we move forward. And this is then the main point. And I want to just take, uh, as I say, take a little bit closer look behind these potential fears. I'll turn a little bit to some uh, recent academic research that's been by scholars that's been conducted over the last decade on these issues. Um, and so there, there are three main texts that I will be referring to just to tease out a couple of the implications of, of, what, we're, um, of what we're working on and what we want to talk about today. So first of all, a very widely cited study by Frey and Osborne that came out from Oxford University in 2013 uh, caused a shudder throughout, uh, you know, the, uh, really the international community because their studies indicated that roughly half of occupations in the developed world could be automated in the coming next few decades. This was extraordinary study, widely cited. But again, what can we learn from that? And, and this uh, number, 47%, was actually cited by Joel Santos as well in his presentation. So what do we tease out from this? First of all, that occupations that were most at risk were medium and low skilled tasks, primarily composed of routine tasks, which I think that Jorge had also mentioned. Secondly, that higher educational levels were correlated with occupations that were less likely to be automated. Uh, and so that's also part of uh, one of the, these big takeaways for us from this particular study. And this, again, was done in a framework of only looking at technological perspective. They weren't looking at, at institutionalities. They weren't looking at uh, economic or social factors, which we know are so important also in adaptation. So just going quickly on to the next, David Autor on labor market polarization. I've underlined this word polarization because of what he found in his studies with this sort of semi sort of upward in this curve, the smile curve, uh, showing that the demand for labor grows in both low and high uh, skilled occupations at both ends of this smile curve. What's happening is in the middle. So this is again adding a bit more texture and layer to what Frey and Osborne were first talking about, that it's actually um, in these middle tasks uh, that are most uh, vulnerable to automation and replacement in these middle skill zones. However, what do we need to, to also tease out from the polarization is instead another concept, which is that we know in reality that productive organizations are constantly innovating their activities and their processes. And as a result, they do need to update their knowledge and their skills. And they need, as a consequence, trained employees to use these new technologies. So what other takeaway word then here is actually complementarity. We're talking about the complementarity The complementarity, in fact, between technological upgrading, consequently their impact on jobs and the world of work, and what you need in terms of skills. That upgrading requires the adequate skills. Technological change may not be as complementary in many of the low-skilled jobs, but in general, new tasks and occupations do require higher qualifications. So let's move on just to the third academic, and I'll try to be brief about that because time is limited. But again, the focus is then it's key. Complementarity is key between the technologies and the skills. Uh, this quote, there are many quotes that have been given. David Alter has a very nice quote that he talks about the uh, a long history of leading thinkers overestimating the potential of new technologies to substitute human labor and actually underestimating the potential for it actually to complement human labor and effort and consequently human skills. So again, the lesson we take from this, that investments in training are central to any long-term strategy for skills development that is complemented rather than substituted by technological change. As a final author, uh, Brinjelson has talked about intangibles, digitalization, productivity. The main point here is he talks about artificial intelligence. And he treats it as a general purpose technology with this wide sort of radiating impact on various sectors. So the point here, again, is that complementary, again, complementary investments that include business process redesign, 
co-invention of new products and business models and the investments in human capital all work together. They're all part of that complementarity that we're talking about. So hence the need to invest in these factors, technology, business processes, and skills. Also, there's so much attention given to digitalization as well. This also in this model indicates the function of increasing productivity requires actually a complex set of skills. It's not merely digital skills themselves, although they are crucial, but it is a complex set of skills. So those are a little bit of some points just going back into to scholarly literature. I want to now talk just about what is the relevance more widely, because a lot of these studies are based on, you know, on the US. David Alter's work is in the US. Fran Osborne was based in the UK. So we're talking about OECD countries. Maybe we can think a little briefly about regions and countries, and especially since ILO Sintafor is based in Latin America primarily, so we need to think about the relevance for our region and our member organizations. So uh, again, the world of work and its related dimensions do vary from region to region. Of course, there's some you know, countries that are developing the technologies, others that are consuming and using the technologies. Different labor market regimes also need to be taken on board, so there is a, a political and institutional dimension in terms of, of how you respond to technological transformation. Informality is a large issue, especially for our region. So workers in the informal economy, which in some countries surpass half of the labor force, this is an issue that also varies and has an impact about how the challenge of skilling people and of, of appropriate technological uh, appropriation and use. And then, of course, the production matrix varies quite a lot across other uh, different countries in our region. Also, the production matrix in Latin America has relied very heavily in recent years about more primary commodities. Um, and so there's also about value added and moving up in the production matrix as part of our region. But again, this is, these are all the considerations that we have. Um, I wanted to just mention a few things then about Latin America since I've raised that issue. So the, um, the Frey and Osborne study, which was merely just looks at the technological impact without looking at institutional or social political structures, um, does say that uh, basically the potential of, of technology to automate tasks is ubiquitous. It really it impacts across the world and across regions. What do we think about the polarization that I mentioned earlier that came up? These polarizing that David Altor had mentioned, the polarizing impact on technology and jobs, that, that smile curve of certain, you know, uh, the lower skill or higher skill tasks are relatively less impacted, the most vulnerable in the middle skilled jobs group. Um, ECLAC, the Economic Commission for Latin, Latin America and the Caribbean, has indicated that that is also a risk for Latin America and the Caribbean. In fact, they estimated that 57% or nearly 60% of the total number of people are in Latin America are in occupations with a high risk of the substitution of technological transformation. You know, and this again is mainly people with medium levels of skills and education. So all of this comes together to reinforce that message that everyone is, is again putting forward. There's a need for higher qualifications and skills for all levels of qualification, and this is relevant for different countries and different regions. It's cited in the US, in the EU, in, in the OECD countries, also for the Latin American context, it remains relevant. Another brief comment for our region then, so about the skills that are needed for the digital transformation. There remain wide gaps in terms of the supply of adequately trained people. So just three points. Digital skills, of course, are, are fundamental to IT-related occupations. Again, this is a ubiquitous uh, phenomenon that is taking place everywhere. Secondly, it would be looking at digital skills that are embedded within other occupations. So again, digital skills are re relevant. They're cross-cutting in terms of other occupations. But what was noted in the recent Latin American economic output of the OECD is that less than half of Latin Americans have used a computer or have sufficient skills to use computers for basic professional tasks. So a challenge is clearly laid out in this statistic for our region. Also at the management level, there are certain innovation skills that are required at the management level that also need to be addressed because sometimes people think that they have the skills, but they actually, there needs to be innovation also at that higher level in terms of tasking. So to wrap up, what does this mean then in terms of TVET? The, this is what our, all of us are engaged with is the role of TVET institutions. What does this mean then for TVET and these labor institutions in general? 
a few of the points then is that the future of work and its implications for the quality and quantity of jobs is all about how the challenge to how to shape skills and skill systems so that they keep people and their skill sets up to date. So we're constantly in motion, as, as Joel had mentioned, you know, it's a moving target. Uh, that constant evolution of skills uh, and skills demands is very real. And it's also related to, as we know and has been mentioned, to these major mega trends or mega transitions that are underway, the digital, the green or, or climate changes, and also demographic phenomena on both, on both ends for youth and also for aging societies. Um, but I also wanted to mention the need, this has also been mentioned, but to emphasize the need for inclusiveness. When we're talking about skilling, we also need to have a very inclusive uh, view as a counterweight to this polarization and to the vulnerability that certain segments of the labor force and certain workers with, with particular skill sets, especially those in the middle, that are more um, vulnerable to technological change and stand to benefit furthermore, much more effectively from investments in TVET and targeting toward them. More specifically for TVET institutions, the complementarity that we're talking about between technological change and skills still remains key to attain improved employability and productivity. In addition, these transversal and socio-emotional skills, or the soft skills, are also part of this complementarity that we have between training and between technological transformation. Some responses that we see are, are more training in STEM and now uh, STEAM professions. There's a very clear gender dimension to this because we need to be encouraging uh, young girls and women to be moving more and more into these areas. Uh, we even know in TVET institutions that, at least in our region, the training, we train men and women um, approximately in same quantities, but there is an occupational segregation often in terms of the training. So we need to also be encouraging more gender equity in these uh, STEM and STEAM uh, professions and training. Uh, also important approaches that we've heard so much and which is such a strength here in the Basque country uh, are approaches via inquiry-based learning. So we know uh, we hear so much from them about these important problem-based learning approaches or project-based learning. So much to be learned from, from their approaches. Uh, and again, different ways of approaching the demand for upskilling, uh, reskilling, upskilling uh, approaches. One cannot make any presentation <laughs> about technological transformation or skilling without making some reference to what we've just been through in terms of the COVID pandemic. There was a clear acceleration of, uh, of a focus on digitalization and digital skills, of course, because of all the remote kind of interaction uh, that was going on. What we learned in Latin America, particularly, was the flip side of that was digital exclusion, that so many people were not taking advantage of this focus on digitalization. So there was just a, you know, access to the infrastructure as well as the equipment and as well as the skills to effectively use digital technologies. This remains a major challenge. So the second point here would be that we need to be preparing people for the future of work, which is the point of this, of this panel, that involves the transformations and transitions that have been identified prior to the pandemic, but adding on what we've learned and what has changed for all of us in the midst of this pandemic. So there's still relevant what was pre-pandemic and the concerns about skills and employment and upskilling, but we also have learned a great deal from the pandemic and we should not lose those lessons. Uh, the focus fundamentally is on the skilling, reskill and upskilling, and also lifelong learning approaches uh, with those soft skills that are part. I will be coming to the end very soon. Um, just a point about why all of this information is relevant for TVET institutions and how they work. There's an indication that comes out of a 2020 study from the ILO looking primarily at youth, uh, the Global Employment Transfer Youth. But what it shows is that there's actually, um, that the, a lot of the training that was seen to be conducted was geared towards some of the autom automatable tasks. This is of concern because we need to, of course, keep our eyes on what are the emerging demands for skilling and adjust the training systems accordingly in order, as we've been talking about, to harness the potential, the upside of all of this technological transformation in terms of what we do as TVET institutions. 
We, of course, and we have public actors here, there's a clear role for public policies. The policy approach also needs to be toward harnessing these opportunities that, that these technological transition is presenting and how to invest in all of these complementarities that I was talking about earlier in my presentation. Uh, therefore, again, within the poli public policy framework, skill development becomes a key dimension. And in order to face these transitions and the challenges to harness the potential of technological transformation is again that public policy also reflects those required investments in terms of the skilling systems of which TVET is a part. Just reinforcing that TVET is key for navigating these challenges, the key role of complementarity, as I've mentioned, because tertiary and university training is at times does not have that same immediate response capacity for the world of work that TVET has, and because TVET is fundamentally geared toward training for the world of work, and you all, we know, embrace, all of your institutions embrace this mandate, and that's how we need to work going forward. Talk, maybe we talk about there is, nevertheless, a, com, a, a space for cooperation between academia and TVET systems. There are ways that we can look at research uh, to be able to see what is the space and the centrality for TVET and how these institutions need to take on board various kinds of investments in change in terms of infrastructure, in terms of pedagogical methodologies, as well as the materials that they're using uh, within their training, uh, training institutions. One last point. Uh, in order to digitally transform and to be able to change and adapt quickly and pertinently. All of this is relevant, but we also need to make our decisions based on evidence. So evidence-based decision-making, policy-making, and investments continues to be fundamental. We need to trans also think in terms of TVET about mainstreaming transversal digital and language skills, also part of our pedagogies. Also developing higher skill sets across all levels of training. This speaks also to the preparation of of teachers and trainers themselves within this new framework, and also uh, the need to not lose sight of inclusiveness and the focus on vulnerable populations and, and companies as well that are at higher risk. My last comment, and my time is up, so I will wrap up just by saying that, again, in terms of public policy, this raises the need for investment and a focus on TVET as an important tool for raising productivity, employability, and inclusion. Uh, also, this idea of sustaining complementarity between technological change, the jobs, and the skills for those jobs. In, you need, that skilling is key for reducing the frictions of adjustment that are involved with these accelerating and constantly involving transitions the skilling, reskilling, upskilling that I've mentioned, and the spillovers that raise productivity, resource, social, and labor exclusion. And as a final remark, because we are an institution of the ILO, as you know, the International Labor Organization celebrated its centenary of its existence in 2019. And in the centenary declaration of 2019, which was again pre-pandemic, but it was very clear as one of the three pillars of, within the declaration was a call for greater public investment in the capacity development, in skills development, to respond and capture the benefits, all the advantages that arise from current and ongoing transitions. And I think that again speaks to the strength of all of your TVET institutions. So thank you very much for your attention.